So I will share with you my perspectives on how nanoscience will provide us with highly ideal lighting systems as well as inexpensive and efficient solar cells to, to harvest the energy from the sun. It's the summer looting. Here comes the sun. It's all right. Little darling, it's been a long, long, lonely winter. Little darling, it feels like years since it's been here. Well, I could sing along for a long time, but I will switch from the song to the next in referring to the almost religious relationship we up here in the northern edge of Europe have to the sun and to the spring. In just a week from now, we will, for the Valpurgis Day and the May 1st, celebrate the return of the sun and the spring to Lund, the place just uh, outside the main university building. So, what is, th what is it that comes with the sun? It is something we call photons. Photons are little particles, quanti uh, quantum, uh, quantized particles of electromagnetic radiation and 10 to the 15 photons hits every square millimeter of the Earth per second at least for the side of the Earth that faces the Sun. So this is a little bit physics-y, I have to ex excuse that, that's what I spend my days doing. Uh, this is now a wavelength scale, you see here the 300 nanometers, 500, 700, 900 nanometers, and you see the distribution of the light from the Sun. The Sun is indeed an extremely hot object, it has 5,500 degrees C, and it radiates in the visible range, which is maybe not so surprising since we, as we saw before, we have used millions of years to develop our sensors that can actually detect and, and see light, right? So we have a lot of uh, uh, visible light with this sort. But to go back to the physics again, light is indeed comprised of small quanta, electromagnetic radiation, so-called the photons. And they behave like tiny little wave package. They look cute. Uh, so the red wave packets have slightly longer wavelength than the green and, and the blue corresponding to what you see here in this energy scale. So we characterize the color by the wavelength in nanometers that you see there. And it has a corresponding energy that we can calculate from just this simple equation. This is my only equation. Uh, 1240 <laughs> divided by the lambda. So if you take a simple case like 620, which makes the math a bit easier, you find that it has an energy of 2.0 electron volt and an orange color. So that was sort of the physics. So light has these very useful properties, and uh, I will show you how nanoscience can, in unique ways, both handle, generate, and detect photons, and how this can actually improve the quality of life for mankind. I will describe two examples of that. One related to lighting, as I said, introductory-wise. We can make a coal light source, which is much, much colder than the sun, likely. And we can also provide uh, very efficient and uh, uh, technologies for harvesting the energy from this solar spectrum that I just shared with you. So back to the distribution of uh, the photons from the sun. We could First, we have one alternative. We could try to mimic the sun. We can and make a very hot filament, which is what we have in, in a light bulb or incandescent lamp. And uh, there we have a temperature of uh, typically around 2,500 degrees C, so it's like the curve down here. That has a little bit of a drawback. You can see that it's only about 4% of the light that from, from the incandescent lamp that shines in the visible part of the spectrum, so that's not so very good. So what we try to do is to see, would there be a way to get efficient light without the heat. So this is first what happens in atoms or molecules or any material that uh, you heat up. You excite electrons in an atom, an electron jumps from an inner shell to an outer shell, and then when it falls back again, it, it can emit a photon, right? That's sort of, a, I think most people have that from school. So what we think of doing is to do the same thing, get the same type of configuration, but without the heat. And that we can do with semiconductor nanotechnology, where we build light-emitting diodes that we can electrically, directly, resonantly populate the energy states that give rise to the photon emission. 
to do that in the symbolic picture up here. So we have a two-level system again. We inject electrons into one level and holes into the other level, and then we get into the excited state configuration as we had here, and then we get to the photon emission. In principle, simple. I'll show you a little bit more how, how it's done, in which way this is a nanotechnology. It's a bit cryptic and complicated, but I'll try to explain it. First of all, let's make a very simplified picture of what is a semiconductor. The semiconductor that will operate as an LED. Uh, it has one, one band of electrons and one band of holes, being negative and positive. Uh, in a diode, the electrons are collected on one end of the device and the holes on the other end of the device, and they don't really see each other. Otherwise, they could uh, recombine. However, what we do is to apply a battery an old-fashioned battery, 4.5 volts, 4 volts battery. And then what we do is that we inject electrons from left to the right, and we inject holes from the right to the left. And where they see each other, they recombine and generate photons. Every recombination can, in principle, generate a photon. And by nanotechnology, we can make this a highly efficient process. And we can also choose the semiconductor, or these quantum structures, as we call that. I don't go into trying to explain that. We can really tune the color over wide ranges and get sharp, well-defined light sources. This is stuff that we do in our lab. These are what we are a little bit well known for, so-called nanowires. Here is a, a cartoon of it. It's a, 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 an LED where you have a core being the end type, for instance, and then you have a radial PN junction and the active material in this type of configuration. So each of these look like uh, chess pieces uh, is an, a complete LED, but if you're going to have a powerful LED, you might use 100,000 to constitute the, the complete LED. And you see the type of dice here where you have the contact to the cathode and the anode, and you, this whole thing that shines up. So you can, for instance, make blue LEDs, you can make green LEDs, yellow, orange, and you can make red LEDs. And this is something that we do in the Lund so say, Lighting Research Center, where we develop nanowire LEDs for highly efficient illumination with the ideal uh, color ca characteristics. Um, this allows us also to get away from traditional bulbs, the, the light bulbs, we, or point light sources, to really get a large freedom in designing bulbless sheets of surfaces that emit light. So I think we're going to see very different type of lighting in our homes, in our schools, and in public places. And you can even think of having wallpapers or wall panels that emit light with special designed uh, technologies. So the next thing I'd talk about is that of uh, the solar cells. So <coughs> here comes the sun again, but without music. Um, What this is, has a chance to do, we heard about uh, the Solar Mama, which I think was a very good uh, documentary film with good contents. We can really offer the Earth by nanotechnology, ideal and abundant renewable energy source being harvested by these technologies. And remember I mentioned that uh, 10 to the 15, 15 zeros here, of photons hit the, surf the, the surface of the Earth per square millimeter in a second. And this corresponds to approximately one kilowatt per meter square. That's an enormous influx of, of, of photons, of energy. And this corresponds to in that in one hour, the influx to the Earth is the same as the Earth consumes in electrical power the in, in the entire year. So it's an enormous source of, of, of power. Uh, here is a slide that I borrowed from the German Aerospace Center. Uh, here you see Sahara, and what they draw here, the, the surface area one would need to cover with solar cells to provide the entire Earth's electricity needs. And this is that of the European Union, and that is, seems to be Germany. So we're not really talking about the full radiation that I saw before, but this is the, the corresponding curve that actually hits the surface of the Earth, because there's a lot of absorption of different uh, kinds in, in, the, in the atmosphere. Uh, there's actually a lot of talk about having these larger areas in Sahara, in New Mexico, in the US, in Australia, for instance. And that means that you would have power stations all 24 hours of the day that would be a, a center that is very well located to harvest the energy from the sun. And with clever uh, systems to transmit power, we can actually really provide uh, technology to the world. So, um, 
let's see how this works. What, what is, a solar, uh, uh, what is a, a solar cell? And I start out by asking, let, let's look at how Mother Nature does it to harvest light and convert that to biological materials like you know, leaves and trees and stuff like that. I'm not a biologist, but I think I know that the, the, the photons are absorbed very efficiently by chlorophyll molecules. And the first thing that these systems do chemically, biologically, is that they very quickly separate the electrons and hold for each other. So the, one, the electron runs in one direction and the hole runs in the other direction. That's how Mother Nature does it. And then they do work and after a lot of complicated biological processes that I don't really know, it comes out as cellulose, for instance. They capture carbon dioxide from the air and they do fantastic things. So we, we, in, in the photovoltaic solar cells, we do something very similar. Uh, then you have again this diode, you remember, this is the same one as the LED. And what we do there is to come in with photons and those photons excite electrons from down here up to the up here and, and, and every such electron leaves a positive hole behind. And the next thing that happens is just mimicking what's happened over here, the electrons are pulled in one direction by this electric field that is built in, and the holes are pulled in the other direction, and then the charges are separated. And the next thing that happens is that you can connect this to an external load, like a lamp, or you can charge up a battery, or you can do all kinds of things. Uh, you do the same trick as Mother Nature you did up here. So I would say basically the same mechanism, yeah, nothing new under the sun. And we do a lot of research in this area as well. Uh, this is a paper that was published just uh, two months ago, or less than two months ago in, in Science, where we had reached a world record in these types of, of uh, highly efficient solar panels, again, based on the nanowire technology that I showed you some examples of before. So each of these, again, is a little solar cell, but they are now confined to very narrow dimensions, 150 or so nanometers in, in, in diameter, and each of those are then connected together to provide very efficient solar cell technology. Indeed, this was the result of a fairly long European program uh, where we had promised, this is actually my coffee mug for seeing from two different perspectives, we have promised the European Union to try to reach the 10% goal, which was very ambitious. People said, how do you dare to say something like that? But indeed, we came almost up to the 15%, and I think that's a very good position for the future. I will conclude by giving, reminding the perspectives that I said initially, that um, nanoscience is offering these technologies for efficiently generating light, as well as for uh, providing us with efficient solar cells to harvest the energy from the, the abundant influx of light from the sun. You know, we had before a, a, strong, a very strong role for the beetle. You remember that talk we had before? Here's the next one time a beetle has a central role in this afternoon's program. So I want to thank them for contributing and for you to for listening. <laughs>